Hello everyone and welcome again to another Teacher Joseph podcast. Many of us really struggle with learning a second language, especially when we are running a home, looking after a family, as well as doing the other things we have to do every day, like working or managing a career. English can come quite far down the list, and when it does reach the top, or perhaps becomes a bit of a priority, we really struggle to balance everything together. Many people who are in this situation and who are learning English in this way really find it difficult to manage their time. Now, the problem with English is that psychologically it's very demanding. And we find ourselves sitting at the table with our English books. We hear children crying in the background. We remember something that we haven't done, like cooking or cleaning. And we're easily distracted by our mobile telephones. And many of you are wondering, surely there must be another way. After all, half the planet, it seems, are able to speak a second language. So why can't I? And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. Easier ways of learning. Now, one of the things which needs to be examined is attitude. The reason for that is because when we're learning, many of us just have completely the wrong attitude. And this is usually based upon how we learn. Because we associate learning with books and imparting information. So, for example, a teacher imparts information to us. We also associate learning with our days at school. When we were supposed to suffer, that was the purpose of school. And so learning for us, at least for many people, is all about a pile of books, sitting on a chair which is relatively uncomfortable, and being distracted by our own thoughts, by things that need to be done, and by our mobile phones. We sit there kind of pretending that we're learning, but yet some part of us knows that we're not really getting very far. And that's because that style of learning and our attitude towards it has long since gone. The days of sitting with books and really trying to pick up words It just doesn't work anymore. Many of you tell me that you sit with a list of words. Within an hour, you've forgotten them. And within a couple of days, there's no trace of them. Rather than looking at rules, which is what we've been taught to do in life, we really should be learning how to demonstrate those rules. Let me tell you something. I was born and raised in the UK. I wasn't taught rules of grammar as a child. It was the 1970s, a time of peace and love, and somebody somewhere in an education department decided that kids shouldn't be taught grammar. They should just be taught how to speak. And so I was. There was a whole generation of us grew up knowing how to use all the tenses, knowing how to speak properly. But if you had asked me, what's the present perfect? I would have said, well, sorry, present perfect, (laughs) no idea. But give me an example of it and I'll tell you what it is. When I became a teacher, I had to learn the names of all of the tenses, and for all the bits of grammar. I had to go through what you went through. But the difference between you and I is 
I knew already how to use it, whereas perhaps you didn't, or perhaps you don't. So with students today, if I say, what's a conditional tense, probably I'll get an answer of, yeah, yeah, that's the one with if. And I say, okay, give me an example. And they'll say, uh, oh, I don't remember because there's so many of them. But yet a much healthier way would be to learn how to speak. And then if you need to, go back and learn what that particular bit of grammar is called. So you see, many of us are doing things backwards. An hour practicing to speak with a language exchange partner or a teacher would be much more beneficial than trying to learn the name of a rather archaic rule. Unless, of course, you're thinking about becoming a linguist. So you see, when it comes to learning, if your attitude is, oh, I have to suffer, I have to sit here for a week and I have to learn the names of all the tenses, then it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You will suffer. And this is why I make podcasts which aren't really about the rules of English, although sometimes I do. They're more about showing you the demonstration of the rule. So, attitude is very, very important. Now, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, yeah, but if I speak with a language exchange partner, he's not there to teach me. He's there to correct me. Yes, of course, you have to do your own study if you don't have a teacher, but you can systematically practice grammar with him without it having to be something major. And anyway, you're probably doing that already. I'm sure you're not saying to your language exchange partner, um, sorry, w- c- could you give me a good example of the conditionals? Uh, probably you're just giving him sentences and he's telling you if they're right or wrong. So that's the first thing, looking at attitude. The next thing is about motivation. Now, it seems that whenever we face a problem with English, especially something that we can't overcome, and that problem could be about time, it could be perhaps missing your regular slot, your time of learning, because of family, because of work, and because of other things that you have to do. What usually happens is a little voice inside you pops up and begins to punish you. You haven't done this. You should be doing that. You haven't done your English. Now, it's very interesting, this, because... This voice, which is coming from your head, actually works to demotivate you. It doesn't come and say, hey, let's start with your English today. How about three o'clock, baby? No, it actually comes with some really nasty negative voices. And the reason for that, again, is related to what I was saying a second ago about how we learned what studying is. It doesn't have to be so boring and dull. So, about motivation, let me tell you something. Whenever we are left at a time when we have nothing to do, we quickly fill that time with something, because none of us like silence. None of us like to feel that there's nothing happening in our lives. Silence is a very difficult thing for this generation to deal with. Many younger people have concentration spans of much less than five minutes. And the mobile phone, the bleep of WhatsApp or Instagram, 
that favourite TV show, and a whole host of other things are there to fill the silence. If you don't meditate, or if you're not meditating at the moment, I really would urge you to try that just for 5, 10 or 15 minutes a day to try to get into that silence so that you're more comfortable with it. Silence is great for many things because it allows you to reflect. In the silence, ideas come up. In the silence, new things come up, things that you might like to try. And in the silence, you can become much more comfortable with who you are. I'm telling you all of this because when you're learning English, you don't want it just to be another thing to distract you from the silence, that existential thing that we don't really know how to deal with. Coming at English from a place of comfort, joy, and happiness is much better than coming at it from a place of busyness. Many of us claim that we are too busy to learn English. We're too busy, far too busy, to do the homework for the teacher. But yet, we do find time to do other things that we like like cooking, spending time with family, going out for the day, going shopping. So there is an issue there with motivation. And we're kind of looking over our shoulders saying, mm, I have to do this English thing, but I kind of don't want to. And it gets shuffled away. Imagine a life where English was welcomed and it was top of the list. When we go on holiday, we suddenly find that we've nothing to do and we're going to fill our day exploring a new city or a new place and we're really fulfilled by that idea alone. With that open-mindedness that we have when we go on holiday, imagine if the voice came, why not learn the language of the local town or city. We would be thrilled. It would really would perhaps uh, lift up our spirits. And that's the kind of mood we're aiming for when we're learning our second language at home. Now, I have to say that when it comes to motivation, if you persistently miss English classes or you really aren't studying alone or doing what the teacher asks. There could be a deeper issue there, maybe involving mental health. So some people try to overcome that by using some very nice techniques. <clears throat> I was talking to someone the other day who's very into fasting. For him, he says that he doesn't have the clarity or mental idea to do anything unless he's fasting. He said leaving out meals and eating once a day allows him to get motivation. Now, I'm not suggesting that you try that, but it's something you might want to look into. In English, the name is intermittent fasting. And it means basically skipping some meals, which does things for your body. And once your body gets used to it, you'll find you've got greater mental clarity. Other things you could try? Well, you could certainly try changing how you learn, as we discussed before, and also making it more fun by writing and talking about things that you like. Now, it is very true that when it comes to language exchange partners, that perhaps they may not have the same things in common with you. If you find that, you can find new topics to talk about, 
why not? It would be a wonderful exploration. But ultimately, of course, you want to find people who share the same kind of values as you do. Language itself is not quite enough in order to get a good conversation going. But you're in control and you can make it as shallow or as deep as you want. Every so often, people come to me and they say they want to learn English. But after I've asked them a few questions, it's clear that either they don't want to learn it, or maybe there's a little problem with their level of motivation. Some people think, oh, it's a great idea, but because of the lack of concentration or maybe some other issues like being busy, they very soon drop out of the race. And those people are usually, uh, usually very noticeable. I mean, they kind of stand out. It's quite easy to identify them when I first meet them. A little voice comes into my head saying, well, that was a trial lesson, but I doubt that person will come back because they don't seem to be very into language learning. So if you're really not sure about your reasons for learning a language, you should go back and review those because ultimately they will motivate you if you have some kind of goal. Other people, particularly older people, just learn languages because it's fun, it's enjoyable, and it passes the time. And that's an entirely different set of circumstances. Another thing that you have to keep in mind is your own belief system. Because if you're the kind of person that says in your mind very cynically about other people, oh, they can't do this, oh, that person can't do that, then ultimately that will be reflected back on yourself about your own beliefs. Because if you're noticing around you things which can't be completed or people who are unable to do things, then that same belief is going to come back around and catch up with you. So it's really important that you come at this from some kind of purity of thoughts that allows you to learn where you can see other people learning, which will be an inspiration to you. Any kind of belief system or idea which includes prohibition or uh, lack or evidence that something isn't right or something isn't working really needs to be reviewed because to try to learn a language with that kind of attitude isn't going to get you very far. Which brings me back again to the topic of meditation. Now that's a scary word for many people and I'm not asking you to rush away to the nearest mountain wearing sandals and a kaftan. What I am saying is that when your mind is quiet, that's the best time to learn, to try to fill it up with things which perhaps are distractions just to avoid the silence is really not the way to go. And that isn't just about trying to learn uh, English. That's also about other things in your life as well. We've all met people that we just know don't seem to have any kind of lack of peace um, and they just flit around from one thing to another, one idea to another. We've kind of all been there. And that's it from me for today. So just to summarize then, your attitude towards learning is largely shaped from your past, 
But remember, there's many other ways to learn and they don't all involve sitting around a table with books in a library with people that you don't know. Practicing the rules is much better than just learning what the rules are. The next thing is about motivation, which is really related to your attitude towards learning. And if you come at this from a, a place of quiet, trying to quieten your mind with those voices which are pulling you in all different directions, you'll find that you'll be much more focused. And the last one, again, is related to the fast two, looking at your belief system and perhaps any issues that you might have. So if you're the kind of person that's very critical of other people and you're declaring regularly how stupid people are, if you're seeing that in your environment, then of course it's also going to apply to you. So you're not going to get very far. I'm not talking, of course, about religion here. I'm just talking about plugging yourself back in to seeing the good. And the example I was giving there with meditation is a really good place to start. It doesn't interfere with any other outward labels you have. You don't have to rush away to a mountain and give it a name. You simply have to rediscover yourself in the quiet. And you'll be very surprised at what that does, not only for your learning, but for your life in general. That's it from me. I hope you've enjoyed this. See you all soon. Bye.